Won't you lend your lungs to me? Mine are collapsing. Plant my feet and bitterly breathe up the time that's past. Breath I'll take and breath I'll give. Pray the day's not poised. Stand among the ones that live in lonely indecision. Welcome to episode 31 of the Crackpot Podcast with LaFond and Lockhart. I want to apologize in advance because our usual setup isn't working, so the sound quality might be a little low today, but we're going to do our best and persevere. Good morning, James. Good morning, Gwen, and I apologize for my tech tardation. <laughs> We started the day with a little tech support, and that always ruins James's day. <laughs> right. I, I, I now feel like I'm coming out of uh, anesthesia after surgery. Well, I guess it was brain surgery of the sort. So. Yeah, brain squeeze. Get the brain juice out and ruin your, your brain for the day. But I think that we can cheer you up with a little bit of... Cheer you up with a little bit of talking. Was that a yawn? <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, when I get sleepy, <laughs> when I try to figure something out or do something with the computer and it doesn't work, I get really sleepy, like I've been hypnotized or something. I feel like I've been drugged. Mm. That's. Uh, it feels like when I came out of anesthesia from uh, you know, from that nose operation, it's, uh, it's very strange. So uh, I... Maybe it's proof that I'm really am an alien. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe that. Episode, <laughs> I thought it was a dream about going to Brigham Young, uh, looking for my golden tablets back, and then his wives beat me up. But maybe it really happened. I, don't know. I was gonna say, in your advanced alien culture, you your computers just do what you tell them to do with your thoughts. You don't have to click menus or. T- type on buttons and stuff like that i would hope yeah so what do, what do you have to potentially throw a lightning bolt into my brain pan uh, this week maybe wake me up uh well a topic that you suggested last week and i thought was a good idea was the history of the feminine condition through the ages and how uh maybe in the 20th century, of course, we all know that women got the vote, and we joined the workforce, and uh, that sort of exciting thing happened. Uh, lots of elected, lots of elected offices were gained by women, but maybe we can reach back into ancient times. Okay, uh, I don't know what the hell I was thinking when I suggested it, because it probably only be two of our readers interested in it, but our listeners, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hope you all read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should also read if you're a listener. <laughs> you should read jameslafon.com and you should go over to Amazon Amazon and buy books by James Lafon. That's another thing I'm supposed to do every time is instruct listeners to buy your books. I just got done reading White Devil, mm. which is not my unauthorized autobiography. <laughs> it's actually the true story of Rogers Rangers. And there's plenty in there about how women had it. There's a, a woman, her last name is Williamson or Johnson, I, I forget. She was kidnapped along with her uh, husband and her children and a neighbor while she was pregnant. She suffered the indignity of, well, the, actually the Abenaki that captured her, they looked after her, they let her ride the only horse because she was pregnant. And when she got to uh, St. Francis, which was a French Catholic Indian uh, settlement on the St. Lawrence River, she was sold off separately from her children. And we're told that there's only one type of person this has ever happened to before, but it happened to this lady from Vermont. She lived right downstream from Fort Number Four. It didn't even have a name. And she ended up writing her memoir in 
1797. This is something that happened to her in 1752, I think. And she lost a lot of people. Her husband ended up being killed in that war. Uh, some of her children were not returned to her. She ended up being purchased and adopted by a white Indian who told her he was English, but he was an Indian chief. And after that settlement was wiped out by Rogers Rangers, they took some captives. One of the reasons why they took captives is the women were good at digging for roots and the the game had been exhausted. The American Indians had pretty much wiped out all of their own animal prey, trying to get more goods from the English in trade. Most of the deferring of uh, America was not done by mountain men. It was done by uh, Native Americans who were trading these furs for, for guns, for powder, for kettles for their wives, for kitchen utensils, and for replacements for their wives and children, even uh, sometimes buying a little sister for their wife so that she can help her with her duties. And this, this, in this story, it, goes really all the way back in time when they when they have spent weeks of hell marching through uh, swamps in the winter time getting to this village and they finally wipe it out now all all the enemy indians in the area plus many of the french are after them and the french were actually the ones that were that had more men adapted to this type of wilderness warfare so rogers took uh, a few children and at least one woman with them. The, the woman was chosen because she was fat and she was also very good. She could carry twice as much as any of the men and they used her as a beast of burden. She was better at getting roots and herbs and things to eat because there was no hunting. And finally, Rogers walked her off in the woods one day and he came back with a sack of meat. And he parceled it out, and she was not seen again. And that's oh, what dear. They, okay, so that's the reason why, they, one of the reasons maybe why they called him the White Devil. Well, anyhow, the the son of the White Abenaki chief survived this. I guess he was too skinny to eat. And a large number of these men, I think half of these men died. Many of them starved to death. Eventually... After her husband is released and she's released and her husband ends up dying in this war and her some of her children are, still remain in captivity. She ends up meeting Rogers and finding out that one of his captives is her adopted little brother. So she uh, and him end up living together and she uh, raises him now as an English person. And she wrote a really touching passage about how savage wife was when she moved onto the frontier and now everything is perfect for a woman she has a house she has a farm there are there's a garden there's cows to milk everything that she needs is in this valley and that's that really that episode kind of illustrates the extremes that women had it in primitive settings and she was living in a primitive setting the only thing that was different about her life and the life of those people in Vermont in the 1740s and 50s was gunpowder. Other than that, they didn't have anything that people for thousands of years before them that lived in the same type of dwellings in the same conditions had. They just had guns instead of bows and arrows. Everything else was the same. Swords, axes, knives, the animals that they dealt with. So that gives us a view of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle for women and risks and dangers. You're you're an asset. She's uh, adopted as an honored sister. The English chief didn't buy her as a second wife. He bought her as a sister to help his wife out and to to help raise his children. And partially because he had a soft spot for her because she was English and he could still speak some English. He had been abducted when he was five or six years old, and his English wasn't too good. And on the flip side, you could be the fat Abenaki woman who may very well have been part Caucasian, all Caucasian. Who knows? Because this was a complete hybrid tribe. This Abenaki tribe was the remnants of six or seven different Native American tribes and numerous people like this lady who were adopted into it and her children. 
her one boy was six years old. He was purchased by a war chief who wanted to uh, teach this boy how to be a warrior. And at six years old, he went off to be an Indian and was hunting. So your status as a woman has a lot to depend on. It depends a lot on the pressures on the, the social group at the time. It can be fantastic. It could be you, know, you could be food. Usually it's somewhere in the middle. And uh, we, we could go over different different eras, if you like, different uh, well, types of people. How much of a factor is the shortage of men? Because you mentioned already that this tribe was absorbing English people and if a man could support a woman, you know, his wife and maybe another wife or a sister, if this other woman was considered, then they lose men in battle or what? what's going on here? Why is there more than one woman per man? It, it depends on what they can, or what the individual man can afford. And depending on his relationship with his wife and what tribe it is, whether it's Urgoys or Algonquin, Pope Houghton had dozens of women. For instance, you'd have a lot of really patriarchal setups uh, among the Algonquin people where the Iroquois, for the most part, the women ran everything in the town. And you weren't going to get a second wife unless your old lady just didn't want you touching her anymore. OK, maybe she doesn't want to get pregnant again. <laughs> and they haven't set up a 7-Eleven with condom dispensers yet. So and she, she might tell you to go out and kidnap a second wife. So that that girl's got the burden of, of raising a child. And in such a household, that woman would be treated like her little sister. So this th this isn't displacement, how you would imagine it today. If this happens, you're going to end up with the, the younger, more attractive lady is going to take over everything, and she's going to, uh, she's going to apply her V pressure onto the husband to set aside the woman. No, that's not going to happen in one of these societies. Because the women actually run the household. His mom still and, has status, even if she's uh, yeah. not and the other sexually. Yeah. Most of these types of societies, hunting and, hunting and gathering societies, and most of them, the men don't even have property. They just have their weapons. The women own all the property. Of course, they have to drag it around. Yeah. It's one reason why women are very, they were the original beast of burden. The introduction of the horse, according to, one historian from the 1920s, uh, a, a British guy in Texas, he claimed that the introduction of the horse to North and South America literally took a huge burden off the backs of women because dogs in North America were not very big and couldn't carry that much. But women could. Mm -hmm. so, and this is this is true in a lot of societies. The woman's first job youth is hauling stuff. This is true, I think, in many current day African cultures where women do the vast majority of the labor and these guys don't really hunt anymore, you know? So it's really imbalanced there. This is true. And uh, I know what you're talking about. And the people I've spoken to that have lived in Africa have told me the same thing. One that the, the women can break your back. Like we saw that one, the one Rwanda Rousey did the judo throw when her yeah. skinny husband almost broke him in half. <laughs> Yeah, because they're hauling stuff all the time. What happens with when you get to agriculture, an agricultural society, what will usually happen is the men will get pushed down into the same status. There's a really brutal picture in the book Fire and Blood, the history of Latin American liberation movement. And there's a sketch from the period of a European tourist, this tall, skinny guy sitting in a chair. And over his shoulder, you see uh, this vista. He's being carried up an old Inca road and somewhere in Peru. He's way up in the mountains. And underneath of the chair is this Peruvian peasant who's got the chair strapped to his back. And the upper portion of the chair is strapped to his forehead. Oh and God. he's literally hauling this man uh, up this mountain. And it's... It's the legacy of nomadic uh, horse riding people conquering other people. And then the men that survive are made into slaves. And the women pretty much have the same life that they always had. They have to do most of the work and they have to do almost all the hauling. And 
and the authority is then taken away from the woman because now the husband is no longer outside of the house doing man things. He's now squashed down into the domestic environment. And this is really what you get, what we call the patriarchy, which isn't a patriarchy. It's, it's just this feminized household where this man now has to be some form of incompetent mother uh, to the house. Yeah. Well, what about child rearing? I, I think it's obvious that the early years, it's mom's job. I think I think in hunter-gatherers societies, it's typical for kids to have to be at least four years apart because it, it's around age four that a, a child can start keeping up with the family on foot, and so mom has her arms free and can have another baby. R- Raya Tannehill, she wrote, Flesh and Blood, The History of the Cannibal Complex. She wrote Sex and History, and she wrote Food and History. It was all part of the same research project. And she spends an entire chapter walking the reader through the process by which patrimony was a confusing issue until the domestication of animals. Now, for instance, there is an Amazon tribe where the women use uh, sperm cocktails to conceive their child. If they want a good-looking, strong, smart son, they will have sex with the best-looking guy in the village, the strongest guy in the village, and the smartest guy in the village. It's like they're they're forming a trinity. That's This is their idea. There's some connection between the injection, in their mind, between the injection and the conception. They don't have microscopes or uh, biologists or gynecologists or anything, so this is a way they figure it out. And there's also the the lack of knowledge as to how generations work out. Once men become herders instead of hunters, they're now studying life cycles of animals that are much shorter life cycles than the human life cycle, and they can actually figure out how breeding works. So this is when they'll start to impose their will more on women and insist on monogamy as well it's usually a one-sided monogamy uh, where the woman just has to have sex with only one man because he doesn't want to raise anybody else's son and this would be the men who figure this out first uh, according to uh, her deduction which was really extensive and i read it so long ago that uh, i can't reconstruct much of it but it had something to do with nursing and menstrual cycles and, and primitive conditions it was a, a, a woman's a woman's lot became worse for that reason once you had settled agriculture. And the other thing, you had two other things that happened. The diet is now lower in protein and animal fat. So this could be a bigger drain on the nursing woman than in a primitive condition. And you're now dealing with grain. You still have, you still maintain the break between the household and the outer world by the men now harvesting the crops. And more successful societies and less successful societies that don't manage building large cities, pyramids and Wakandan spaceships. The men will have a tendency to just hang out, uh, occasionally rape the women or make fun of them or or whatever they do while the women do all the work. But in more successful societies that generate larger surpluses, what you'll have is the men now doing the planting. For one thing, different ways of tilling the soil, women don't have enough upper body strength to manage plows in most cases, especially with primitive designs and certainly with different types of beasts of burden strapped to them. So you now have the woman is still inside of the house and she's grinding the corn and other grains that the men harvest, that the men plant and harvest. The harvest might be a shared thing where they're, where they're all outside and they're sharing it. But the important thing is the grinding of the corn falls to the women. The women also have to bear the the laundry and water weight and carry the children around and everything. There's still now at this point in this early agrarian society, the men and the women are doing about the same amount of lifting. And until until some asshole decides to make them build a pyramid, then the men are doing a lot more lifting. The thing that really tears up women in these primitive agrarian societies is grinding corn, which is usually done on the knees. And when you look at archaeological digs that are done, these women, by the time they're 30, have horrible arthritis in their knees. And they've got to haul the water back and forth 
to the water hole and everything. So what, the malnutrition, uh, particularly to the to the mother that's pregnant and nursing, uh, this all results in smaller people, people that get osteoarthritis in their joints uh, much earlier than they did in a in a dangerous uh, hunting society. And the other thing is they're now getting a lot of diseases from living in close proximity to these animals that they didn't used to get. So your most unhealthy people in history are these poor ancient people who are having a low protein, low variety diet, uh, an enormous amount of labor. They're living in crowded conditions with animals. Yeah. And this has uh, been most of mankind's lot through most of history. Civilized history. Yeah. yeah. When yeah. you look at history and history's just considered the, the, the civilized record. Right. So, but at any given time, up until the industrial age, most of the land area on the planet was occupied by people living according to an older mode of existence. And when people got a chance to live that way, they usually chose to stay, even when they were originally abducted, even as adults. Uh, Quanta Parker, who is one of the darker Native Americans that you'll see, is half Anglo-American. He was the chief of the Comanche people. They made a deal with the U.S. government after the Civil War. During the Civil War, they were scourged. But afterwards, after some battles didn't go their way, they ended up becoming allies to to the United States government. And it used to really anger. uh, His last name is Parker because this is a society that's got a lot of matriarchal aspects to its structure. And he takes his mother's name, which was Parker. And when his father used to hold treaty meetings, and he lived in a house with the men in Texas. They'd be scandalized when his wife, who was a white woman, would be serving the food in the drink. And that, that was they thought it was a slight, but it was he actually had his wife serving them. He, he didn't he didn't see it as a slight. So your your status for your women and for your men is just better when you're living in a primitive setting. So you'll usually see people who have a choice will opt for the more primitive lifestyle until you get to the industrial era where you start to have a lot of creature comforts and you start to get some modern medicine. Yeah. And uh, those things are still highly attractive to people. Magellan, when he put down in, uh, I think it became Rio de Janeiro. It was, it was where, where he put in for food and water. His men, his men were immediately trying to jump ship and go live with the natives that they got these naked girls that bathe that are climbing onto the ship and actually the women are used in primitive societies as thieves especially when they're dealing with more advanced societies Uh, there was a great scandal because Magellan's voyage was supposed to be a monastic journey it was supposed to be very aesthetic these men even though most of them had been taken out of prisons he was essentially a crusader and you were only supposed to have sex with your wife and she was at home and you're going to abstain for the three years of this journey. <laughs> well, when, the, when, when these sailors finally get in the port, it tends to be a different story. And there's a, a real reluctance amongst the officers to touch any of these women because these are the guys that uh, Magellan will chop their heads off if he catches any of the officers doing anything like this. So the men are in charge of keeping the, the officers in charge of keeping the men away from the native women, and the native women are climbing on board ship naked, and they're using their private parts to conceal stolen objects like nails, which were considered very valuable. So they find this one woman with a whole bunch of nails, you know, clenched. It, 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 similar to what modern criminals do in prison, where they store razor blades and knives in their rectum. Uh, women were using their vaginas for this. Uh, so there's another value that Thievery and intelligence is very important. For instance, the uh, Crow Indians used to let their modern Crow Indians, I'm sure none of them will admit to this, but their women were free to go prostitute themselves at the fort on the at the forks of the Muscle Shell River. They gathered intelligence. That's one reason why the men tolerated this. The the women would do this for for tools. They would trade favors for modern kitchen cutlery and different things and the, that that they, makes me laugh for some reason. Like, right? Got a they new KitchenAid mixer for, for you. <laughs> they would also trade sex for bullets and guns for their men, 
And, but most importantly, they would get intelligence. I don't know if this is if this is a normal fact of biology with men and women, but at least the way Native American societies developed, the translators, the people who traveled from tribe to tribe, usually with a male escort, that served as uh, as interpreters were women. At least on this continent, they seem to have a more elastic capacity for languages. So you have bilang you have bilingual Native American women having sex with soldiers and fur trappers and, and homesteaders and miners and, and wolfers and getting information from them, also receiving goods uh, that their people can use, and then taking this information back to the men in their tribe. And it was understood that even though the men might be allied against the Sioux right now with the trappers and they might be at peace with them and trading with them, at some point, if there was a disagreement that could not be worked out, there would be war between these native men and the men in the fort. So they were gathering intelligence ahead of time. And this was, it seems like, the the first contact in, in North America uh, generally had to do with trading between Europeans and North American uh, natives. Generally had to do with trading female companionship for information and most importantly for metal for steel and iron there were when the jamestown settlers set down in virginia there was already a lot of pre-existing steel and iron that was being used uh, in composite weapons and this probably came from trade because you had fishermen and explorers on that coast for over 100 years uh, before there were any permanent english settlements it, it might be a good time to go go back again to uh, earlier eras of uh, of women uh, since uh, since it, we've been on the Native Americans and it's yeah. it's kind of well, a Stone Age study you could look at. Okay, what other Stone Age cultures and how do they differ? Which ones can you tell us about? Well, there's there's only a limited amount we can glean from Neanderthals. It seems like, and this is a very important aspect here, all, all these genetic studies, people that aren't pure Africans find out that they have some Neanderthal DNA in them. And this has to do with a period of time between 150,000 and 40,000 years ago when modern Homo sapiens were pretty much bottlenecked in the Middle East. Maybe there's some genetic memory that this is where we were stuck for so long and why all these world religions are centered right there. I don't know, but it's a it's a bottleneck coming out of Africa and going to Asia and Europe. It seems like the modern Homo sapiens that coexisted with Neanderthals at the time of the bottleneck event, which was 74, 75,000 years ago, when there was a Toba super eruption, uh, gigantic, uh, the biggest uh, volcanic eruption that has been uh, that has been studied, and it wiped out most of humanity. Now, it did not wipe out the Neanderthals in Europe. It wiped out most of everybody that was in Asia and Africa. And the people who had made it out then, it seems like they were pushed into Asia or they were pushed back into Africa, and they did not succeed taking Neanderthal ground. This does not seem to have happened until about 40,000 years ago, once the the atlatl was finally invented, which uh, gave the advantage to the tall, skinny, relatively fragile modern Homo sapiens over in the Neanderthal, right. who would be four times as strong. And Neanderthal is as strong as a chimpanzee. Okay, it's like a 150-pound chimpanzee could literally rip your hands and feet off of your body. Now, all of the Neanderthal DNA that's been uh, located in the modern human genome is patrilineal. So it was all Neanderthal males having sex with Neanderthal females. There is no, there's, there's no maternal Neanderthal DNA in the genome, which really means that these, these women were highly protected and their men were very predatory. If you look at what happened to the Gomerans, the Gomerans were the toughest warriors on the seven uh, of the seven major Canary Islands. And the first two Canary Islands are lowland islands. They were conquered early by Italians and French. But the big islands in Gomera, the Portuguese, the French, 
the Spanish, they all busted their teeth on this. The armored knights couldn't beat these guys. For one thing, you're talking about six foot two inch Caucasian guys with, with really big sticks that are mountain men, uh, fighting five foot seven inch guys in armor. And it's just like whacking a tin can of meat around your backyard. It, it wasn't even much of a fight. If consistently for a hundred years, the Spanish get beat up until they make an alliance with the Gomerans. The Gomerans, we talked about this in an earlier podcast on, on some fiction I wrote. They were all descended from exiles from Fire Island and from the Big Island. These were all descended from men who had to swim at least 20 miles across the open ocean after wow. they had to sweat to go live on this little rocky island. So <clears throat> the Spanish, actually some Portuguese captains adopted a couple of these uh, Gomeran chiefs, but the Spanish used these guys as human, human bloodhounds to hunt down and kill the Fire Islanders and uh, the Big Islanders. And then while these guys were all away fighting, the Spanish took their women as wives. When they came home and complained, the Spanish killed them because there wasn't a lot of these guys and they were already in the Spanish organization. So you have almost no, of Gomeran people, you have almost no paternal Aboriginal DNA. And almost all the paternal DNA is Spanish. So this shows at one point a modern Homo sapien culture was subject to Neanderthal predation, which consisted of partially of rape of our delicate women, and none of their women seem to have been subjected to this over the long term. And this might have something to do with all of our the Sasquatch, Wendigo, Abominable Snowman, King Kong, all of these werewolf, all of these complexes about these these uh, cannibalistic or vampiric and and sexually charged beings that live in the dark and in the forest, which in a lot of cases is the same thing. The forest is dark an hour before the open ground is, and the, the Neanderthals also have much larger eyes, so they may have been nocturnal hunters. So that plays into probably even vampire mythology. The other group of primitive people that, so we could say Neanderthal women were probably very well treated. The other group of primitive people that most people don't even know exist, and not many of them are left now, were the Capoid people, the Sand Bushmen, the Ikung. They dominated the continent of Africa until Malaysians who immigrated to Madagascar and started trading with continental Africans introduced iron working technology and the yam. By 500 AD, the use of iron and the growing of the yam, uh, which is a really good tropical crop, now permitted Bantu peoples to start to up their numbers and displace those who had terrorized them for tens of thousands of years. Is that which, true? Yes. That when you look at how much of the map of Africa was owned by these little Bushmen and these are wicked little dudes. They're very smart. They're small, but they use poison arrows and poison okay. darts. Yeah. And even when the, there was a German, co the German colonists ended up getting along very good with Bantu Africans and during the sideshow campaigns during World War One, the, the African soldiers were were doing very well against European military formations under German officers. The Germans treated the Africans very well. And one of the reasons why the Africans were, especially in southern Africa, were trusting of the Germans was that the Germans pretty much annihilated the uh, sand bushmen in the Nanib. There had been long term warfare between these people that had been pushed to the arid margins by by the more numerous Bantus. They've had a hard time ever wiping these people out. But with guns, the Germans actually went there and genocided the Kapoid people for the Bantus. And this is also where you get the, the mess you have in South Africa. The Hottentots were Kapoid people. And they ended up sandwiched between the Dutch and the Zulus who all wiped them out. And then they end up meeting in the middle. The Southern Africa wasn't a Bantu area. That was not a black African area. You know, that was one of the last strongholds of these icon of, uh, of these capital. And there is modern documentation that, that alone among primitive people, you have female on male domestic violence amongst these people. Now the women are bigger. Now the men have all the deadly weapons and everything, 
But these women have extra status. Why do these women have extra status? Uh, they are unique amongst women for having they have an actual an extra collection of fat cells on the top of their rear end. They actually have this large boxy rear end. It's right. It's 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 considered horrifying by a lot of European people. And, and it's like it's it's like so much. It's beyond rap video, hip hop, honey desirability okay but this is very important when you're living a hunting hunting and gathering lifestyle this woman also has uh she has an entire extra labial structure that other types of women don't have these are the most unique physically unique modern homo sapiens there are we might want to consider uh, the capoid people maybe distant cousins as far as the way their uh, socialization worked out with the neanderthals would have a predatory relationship instead of a trading relationship with uh, the larger, uh, technologically more advanced uh, homo sapiens that they were neighbors to. And their women have higher status. Well, in a very primitive setting like that, this woman has a high status because she's like a human camel. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. If you load her up with a watering hole and you can march her across the desert and not even give her anything to eat or drink, and she can still nurse your child. So... Uh, this is another group that had a lot of status, and they were slowly and steadily eradicated by larger and, I'm told, uh, higher IQ black Africans. with Who had now been right. equipped with Iron Age weapons. Right. And it is interesting to me that a large rear end is so surprised amongst these people. So Yeah, it, and it, I mean, everybody <laughs> does like... But, it's it's not that uncommon across cultures, and it's important because you mentioned nursing. Right. That it's a store of value. It's a store of value, and it's a store of things like um, omega three fatty acids and just extra nutrients. Actually, you know, our bodies store them there. It's weird, but it's true. Okay. Okay. So their competitors who slowly eradicated them generally live in societies. Uh, I know we're taught that. African societies are all matriarchal, and they are not. There's very few matriarchal aspects to native African society. These are extremely patriarchal societies, and the men will tell you so. And where we get the mythology that Africans are matriarchy is the fact that we had, when you had people of European descent holding black Africans in bondage in America, the patriarch of the family was actually the master, the government. And you end up the, this matriarchal African American thing is this, is really just an adaptation to uh, patriarchal decapitation by the system, which now happens in the form of a welfare state instead of the slave plantation. <laughs> and the, so I wasn't laughing at the slave plantation thing. I was laughing at, uh, one of the young children there sticking her tongue out at me. <laughs> we're, we're doing a video Skype. So we could kick off here to more advanced societies that advance farther than the sub-Saharan African model and talk about how some of some different societies uh, treated their women. Or how okay, well, and I, I want to take like a little bit of a turn and talk about... Yes. Well, what we think of as Islamic societies, but it's maybe, you know, not necessarily limited to Islam, but this where it becomes kind of hyper, hyper controlling. And I don't want to say patriarchal because that's not a functioning patriarchy either, but it's uh, where we see really severe legal restrictions on women, legal and cultural restrictions on women. You see that in societies that have been unsuccessful militarily. So as the capital, uh, there was not a great difference between the treatment of uh, women in medieval times from Christian to Judaic to Islamic societies. There, there was not this huge difference that you see now. It didn't change with initial Islamic success. But since European, since the Europeans actually successfully defended themselves at the Second Battle of Vienna and the, the, the Polish rescued the Austrians. We've been in an era of colonization, and we're still really in an era of Western colonization of Islamic countries. So I just see this when it crops up 
as a symptom of the men in the society suffering really military emasculation. They can't successfully beat the enemy in wars. Their sense of control and their social order, especially in a country that's being plundered by enemy nations, maybe is partially mollified by this uh, lockdown on the field. The book project I've been working on for a couple of years and will take another year, Dread Grace, is really about this phenomenon that highly successful societies in the West, their women tended to have more freedom. And when women in these societies did come to power, they would wage war more often. And you can you can see a little glimmer of this and how the Zulu structure was the men of the Zulu nation who were the most successful African military power ever. They, you know, they used short spears to defeat modern British military units. Their men were not allowed to have sex. Their, their boys were not allowed to have intercourse. Uh, there was a certain ritualistic thing they could do with their fiance, but it wasn't intercourse and it wasn't other things we would think of as sex today. Men were not allowed to have sex with their wife and consummate the marriage until they went into combat. It gives you an idea. I know from being promoting a few charity fights and fighting on some different cards and being at some different fight venues, the higher proportion of women of marriageable age that are present, the harder guys fight. Period. You could just put three women in a room and these guys are going to fight harder than if there's 30 guys in the room when they're watching them. And they do a lot of fighting for approval of other men. That's a big part of it, but the couple of fights I put together to, rain, to raise money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital, I just bought five tickets and gave them the good-looking women so these guys would kill each other so everybody would get their money's worth when they showed up. Okay, that's It's that simple. So societies that don't permit that, they're not, their men tend to not be very successful in a war. For instance, the Romans were more successful than the Greeks, so the Roman women had more freedom than the Greek women did. Do you think it's a feedback? Do you think that the, the cause and effect is only in one direction? Or do you, like, which comes first? M more freedom for women or military success or sort of both that happen at once? The mechanism is if the approval of a woman can get her for you, then you're more likely to be a successful fighting man. If you're in a society where her opinion doesn't matter, and it really comes down to an economic exchange where you know, she's either being purchased or rented or you're somehow combining your houses with another man's house. You're getting into a merchant arrangement here where you're looked upon as your you know, what kind of store of economic value are you to be marrying into my family? Nathan Bedford Forrest, this uh, he proposed to this woman the same day that he saved her in this uh, in this river that was washing her carriage away while these other men just stood there and watched on the bank. That was enough for her. That was, she approved to him. She wanted this guy to be her husband. Her father, who had to say so, he wanted to know what his, what Nathan's business prospects were because he's worried about bringing money into the family. He wants economic status. So this is where you see the difference between the two worlds right there. I think Nathan's answer to him was I've I've always treated my dogs and horses well, <laughs> and I've avenged my mother. <laughs> and, you know, so is, yeah, so he was still a primitive guy. If you have a society, let's say he's an oddball, the way he grew up. Most of the men in the South were not fanatical fighters like him. In a society where that woman's choice is permitted, but there hasn't been any emasculation. Right, right now, the, the woman has full choice but you have a very emasculated crop for her to pick from. And she has a lot of economic pressures of her own. She's now almost put in a position of being her own father, her own mother. Uh, if you have a society where the men are still the ones that are going to be earning and you have a lot of, you have a lot of uh, masculine dynamics still going on in a society, then a woman's approval is going to tend to fall along the lines of that young lady. OK, and, and still now the, the, the thing that you get with criminals being courted in prison by crazy cat women. And, you know, I talked about this guy, Dante, before he, he's got 20, 25 year old rich girls that just want to come to the biker clubhouse and service him and his buddies. 
because they're dangerous guys, because they're the kind of guys dad's afraid of, which in a sense tells you, I wish that was my dad. I wish my dad was somebody to be feared. You know, and he's like, this is insane. You know, I'm, I'm now 45 years old and these 25 year old girls still want me. It's because there's just not a lot of that. So you, you, there's glimmers of it right there. But when there's when you have the power of feminine approval linked to a warrior culture, like what the Zulus did, that's the starkest example where the head guy says, you're not getting laid till you go kill for me. OK, so that's, where? That's, Okay. So does that feed into the women's, the women who become more belligerent, basically? Like, we, we talked about that women, monarchs, queens in Europe were more likely to start wars and get into wars. And then uh, we've also... The end of, we'll discuss that with Elizabeth and Isabella. Okay? But if you can look at the effect at... At the most primitive level that we would find a, as a livable society, if we go back to, to ancient Greece, the people that, that punched above their weight, the only reason why the Greeks have really come to our attention as a great people is because of the Spartans. All of the great intellectual gifts that come down through us, to us from the other Greeks only got to us because of the Spartans. And they didn't have an intellectual culture. They, they had this hyper-masculine culture, but how they arranged it was the position of the woman is that her, her aunts selected a husband for her when he was 21. From age zero to seven, the boy is with the mother. At seven, he's taken away and he's put in a gogi. At 18, he can begin his sexual apprenticeship with women who are past childbearing age. And they basically teach him how to have sex. And then these same women find a match for him amongst their younger relatives. So this is basically your oversexed aunt going out and, you know, find finding a guy for, for, for the 18-year-old girl. When she's done with him. Right. And now the woman is now the head of this household. It, it, this guy is a full-time fighter. One of the problems with that the society ran into is he wasn't home enough to keep her pregnant. Because these guys will often have very long deployments because they were a small force uh, wielding power over a very wide area. Uh, so this is these were the only women that had their own athletic competitions in ancient Sparta. There was also at one point there was there was a situation where the women actually decided on the conduct of a mil military campaign because they felt like their men had failed them. So you can see that's the nascent thing there. If you basically what we've, uh, what has happened with military since then is militaries have tried to organize themselves. So they're all little Spartas within some other kind of nation. And the feminine approval is still very important. That's why you would have things like eventually you would have the development of uniforms and medals and different things, triumphs, different things that would appeal to the people at home, which to the army is the feminine aspect of the society. Even though it's not just women at home, you have slaves and, and scholars and, and politicians and everything. Uh, when the army's coming home, that's like the man coming home to his wife. In the medieval Europe, because of the feudal structure, women started to have more moral authority because you had this highly fragmented structure and it did hold at bay the whole the whole banking order of civilization we have now. Uh, the feudal system did a lot to retard that. And there's no uh, there's no accident that the Japanese developed a great honor culture in a feudal setting because you don't end up with this type of monolithic social pressure that can be very emasculating. And you end up with the tradition of courtly love. Uh, Joseph Campbell probably discusses this the best and the power of myth and it's really an affectation, the, the fact that a, a woman at a joust would give her her favor in the form of a scarf to some guy that would go fight for her was really a way of ritualizing this remnant ideal that you had from the past. One negative aspect of this in Europe, from the pagan perspective, it was a negative aspect, was the great moral authority that was given to women. It's not that they had more than men. But in some areas, they had an equal say and their approval of a man mattered somewhat until you got into the English mercantile system. Women in Europe had some kind of say over whether or not they were going to marry somebody, at least pagan women. 
missionary work by the Catholic Church in pagan areas, which includes early modern Mexico, North America, focused on the cult of the Mother Mary and selling that to the pagan women as a way of getting the wife of the king. Who Now, mind you, this wife of the king is not going to be some elevated slave girl like in a Conan novel. She's going to be the daughter of some other king that made a deal with this king and arranged a marriage. She has some she carries some clout with her. Uh, You don't want her running home to her daddy when he's got his own army. This results in princesses and queens pressuring pagan kings to force Christianity upon their men. And you retain in Catholic societies, you actually retain a lot of female authority. Just look at Italians, the way those households are run. All the Italians that I know, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the women don't go to any great pains to hide their opinion. So it, this does result in th- that aspect of paganism being preserved in Christianity with women having more of a say because that was the vehicle for getting in. Ron West wrote about uh, the history of the Blackfeet Nation and how the Jesuits actually, uh, since the the men of the Blackfeet did not consider priests to be really men, they were like these, they were just these weird asexual creatures. They didn't mind them spending time with their wives as spiritual advisors, and then they convert behind the backs of the men. The women are converted to Catholicism and start inducting the children into this pacifistic theology which is totally at odds with the Blackfeet, were the most warlike of the Northern Plains nations. But it was totally at odds. what so. made those Christians pacifistic? Because Christianity by no means has a history of pacifism. That's kind of a modern uh, it, innovation. It's it, start, it started out being sold as a pacifistic theology. Now, at a certain point, when it becomes a state religion, then it becomes militarized again. But it's always brought in as a pacifistic religion. That's how it's sold to people, and it tends to be sold more successfully to the women in pagan cultures. And you look at what happened with the Aztecs, and that you end up with the Virgin of Guadalupe. They've even got their own homegrown feminine aspects to Catholicism in Mexico, for instance. So it's syncretization, and it's an old Greek uh, concept, the, the thing that the Greeks were most interested in when they were traveling with Alexander as he conquered the world was pairing up the gods. Like, OK, this God is equal to, is, is the same as this God of ours. That was their system for dealing with things. Catholicism takes that and uses the cult of the Mother Mary to sell it to pagans. And then once they become Christianized, then you end up with a greater female influence in those societies, which really comes not from Christianity. It comes from. That's the old pagan element. And you'll see, like, with the witch-burning craze in the 15, 16, and early 1700s that you had in Europe and for a little bit in North America, you see that played out as a reaction to to pagan feminine elements remaining in in the Christian world. For instance, with things like midwives. Uh, A lot of those were just burned for being midwives. I don't know how you'd expect a priest to deliver a baby, but anyways. uh, this, This gets really crazy when you get to the age of exploration and you have the boldest man appealing not to the king but to the queen ferdinand and isabella in spain that was an alliance she was her own queen she made an alliance with ferdinand yeah. spain was because spain was several kingdoms at that time right right so, so she brought her she, own ki- kingdom in she is the one that columbus ap- appealed to and granted his charter to go on his journey. And with Elizabeth in England, the way the the war with Spain was sold when the Armada was sailing, and the Armada never had a chance. The English didn't even throw didn't throw more than half their ships into the battle. They were actually arguing over who was going to get to slaughter the Spanish. Their queen was a virgin. And every one of every man of the officer class, Queen Elizabeth was his potential virgin bride. There was one guy that even hopped on the back of his stag, which was, you know, they ran these things around and and hunted them on estates near London. He hopped on the back of his stag and rode it to her residence 
and while he was still on its back, stabbed his sword in its heart and killed it right in front of her door to try to impress her. All these guys, Walter Riley, all these guys want to be her husband because then they get to be king. And when the Spanish Armada sailed, the people of England were basically told that they were going to fight to prevent the rape of Elizabeth. This country uh, wages war based on the, I guess, very practical and very noble consideration of not having their virgin female head of state raped by uh, Spanish soldiers. Although that wouldn't have happened. That would have, she would have become the property of, uh, I think Philip was the king at the time of Spain. But you, you see the most, what the old term was daring do, Earl Flynn type stuff, going out and, and raiding enemies, trying to find enemies that don't even exist, even picking little mini wars with these, with these countries that your country is not at war with just to impress Queen Elizabeth. And that's all the, the King Arthur stories are like that. When you said that looking for enemies that don't exist, these knights were just riding around looking for adventure, looking to see who would, uh, would be willing Under, to fight them. One of the biggest slavery myths we have is that, you know, white people went into darkest Africa and went on safaris and kidnapped all these black people. When in reality, they bought almost all of them from other blacks on the sea coast. But there is a nugget of truth to that old myth. Hawkins, who was surpassed by Drake, he get, Drake ended up gaining the favor of the queen that Hawkins previously had after they were, Drake was the subordinate in a battle that Hawkins lost and Drake saved the day. So then he became the man. They're fighting over her favor. Well, how did Hawkins get her favor? He went to Africa. Now, this is before quinine before anything to defend yourself against malaria or yellow fever or, or anything. He took these overdressed Englishmen in these reeking boats down to the coast of Africa and actually conducted three slave raids where he actually attacked African villages on the coast and dragged the, uh, the population off in chains. In fact, his crest, when he was knighted, has an African girl dressed up with this great headdress on the crest because he brought her African servants as a present. It was something that was very rare in England. In England, only the super rich would, ha would, rich would have some kind of Islamic or African servant person. So the, the whole age of exploration blooms under Elizabeth, uh, not to mention a few very nasty wars with Spain, and it's conducted in this atmosphere of seeking her approval as if you know, as if there are a couple of guys on a prize fighting card hoping they're going to get a date with a ring card girl. And, I mean, it's it, it's really that simple. And uh, there's probably other reasons why these queens went to war more often. But one of the reasons why they went to war more often was because the men under them were pushing for war because they wanted to be able to gain her approval. It was just the fact that she was a woman made these men more likely to try to find a way to go to war. Right. It, th then there's the other problem, the Hillary, Cl the, the Hillary Clinton. Ugh, the Hillary uh, Janet type, Reno. Uh, right. There's there's that aspect of it. And even the Vikings had that. The, the first permanent settlement that we know of in modern and what's now modern North America became kind of the the fiefdom of this one crazy woman who was the daughter of a chief at home and she was married to the chief on this expedition and she actually conducted murders of other women of men and she led a battle by beating the flat of her sword on her naked breast and scaring off the indians who were actually beating up the, um, the vikings so there was a lot of problems in pagan viking culture with women stirring the pot and causing a little bit too much trouble when they would get out of hand. And that, that's what you see, I think, resurfacing with people like uh, the Gorgon Queen and Jay Manrino. I, I think that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the virtual, you know, psychotic dyke thing that just, just this thirst to go to war and to bring down the, the paramilitary police hammer. Um, yeah, even kind of, Madeline Albright was there saying that the, the sacrifice was worth it of uh, the Iraqi children. Right, and it, all these women are remarkably ugly too. So it, it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting factor, but part of it is that the military men in that realm that's run by a queen or a female head of state are going to be more likely to try to manufacture conflict with outsiders, and they're going to be more protective of her. Okay, there's. Um, so how does that bring us into the twentieth 
and 21st century. I mean, we talked a little bit about Hillary. Uh, we came, we saw he died, and then a, followed by a shrill cackle when she was talking about Gaddafi. Yeah. Um, but also just to, like the ordinary culture where women have very much equal and in, in many areas more than equal representation in men. There's more women than men in college and uh, in certain sectors of the economy. And this, and then why do women, you know, that? and that's another question is the, the economic activity. You know, we have this materialistic view of that it's not, if it's not in GDP, it doesn't exist where most of traditional women's work w wouldn't have been counted it, in, in GDP. Raising children and looking after the home and doing, even if it's labor, it's certainly a woman on a farm is doing a lot of labor, but that stays within her family, you know, preserving food and gardening and things like that. The cruelty aspect is very simple, and it's the same, same thing that you see with the addiction to sports and in the ancient Roman world, the addiction to cruelty and public spectacles. The cruelest human being is the human that's in a powerless body. That's the cruelest person. So that by nature, a woman is going to have more potential for cruelty than a man, because when it comes down to it, she's powerless in most situations that get beyond social intercourse and become physical or combative. I recently watched a, a documentary on the police department in Flint, Michigan, and you have a female police officer even saying that she's constantly intimidating. She's constantly intimidated while she's on calls. When you put people under great stress and you deny them power with poor men, it could be the, the denying them the power to act with any woman. It's the fact that outside of uh, using social mechanisms, they don't really have the power to force their will on other people. And this is one reason why there's more abuse of children by the mothers than by the fathers. And this varies in what segment of society you're talking about. But this is consistent, is that more women beat their children than men beat their children because the women feel powerless. And it's also where I believe you get wife beating from. The, 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 the one thing that primitive societies now, the people that come from the Desinovians, OK, your people in New Guinea and Australia. There's plenty of evidence that they those men are very cruel to their women, even in a hunting and gathering setting. And there's evidence that you had men killing and eating their own boys in Aboriginal Australia. There was and you just don't see this in other societies in primitive European and primitive Native American societies where they're hunting. You don't see that. And you also don't see it in primitive African societies that are just hunting societies like the pygmies. You don't see this internal violence. These people will be hyper violent against other groups and they'll be very gentle within their own group. And this is in a civilized setting. It's the opposite. In a civilized setting, your man is more likely to beat his wife than he is to throw hands with another man. And it's because he's emasculated. He's pushed down into the household as a woman with the wrong parts for the job. And he doesn't have any power in a greater society. And you also note, I spent a lot of time with men who fight as a hobby and men who fight as a living. There might be a couple of notable nutbag exceptions, but for the most part, prize fighters are far less likely to touch their women with their hands than other men are. It's almost universal. Some women only date guys that are into fighting because they're not going to get touched. They're not going to get beat up by these guys. And you'll usually see the women actually controlling those relationships. It's, it's almost comical. Some of the most dangerous guys I know, you just find them following their, their wives around like, like some Rottweiler on a leash. You can't wait for his snack. The, the status of women suffers at the same time that the masculinity of the man suffers when he's shoved down into the household. And I think this is what generates this tide of cruelty that goes through our society. And Native Americans just thought that white people and black people were insane because they beat their children. And that was the greatest evidence because you don't build a good warrior by beating them when they're a child. And you, know, make you, and, and you also don't build a good team member by making them that distrustful of authority you know, by having the people that nurture him also beat his ass. 
as far as the economic stuff goes, uh, I'm pretty much a blank slate there. (laughs) 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 But it, it connects to the materialism of our culture, right? Because if you look at, I, I like to read to the girls like, uh, the little house books and they're really uh, detailed. They describe everybody's chores and work, you know, and so mom was busy, you know, mom was churning butter and raising certain crops in her garden and preserving food all year round, not to mention cooking huge meals. So, you know, women always work. We, we've talked a lot all about the work that they do, but in modern America, if woman is not outside the house earning a paycheck that gets registered in with the IRS, then it's not it's not part of GDP and it's not it's not real. It, it's not valued. From my my four years bathed in the American economy as a supermarket manager, I noticed that women were consistently better workers than men. Now the best workers were always men, but there wasn't many of them. You had to be able to find a man who could conceive of this as a masculine pursuit and go at it like I did. For me, stock and shelves was a sport. I want to be able to put more cans on the shelf in an hour than you can. Okay, so (laughs) I mean, that's it. But as far as average people and below average people, women were consistently better uh, workers, better producers. But when it came to dealing with security problems, when it came to any management function, uh, when it came to speaking with customers and doing customer service, the women were disasters, I, just total disasters. It's, I would take the best girl, the girl with the best head on her shoulders and recommend her to the lady that scheduled the the women on the front end. And she would end up in the courtesy booth where basically you know, that's the supermarket's version of the carnival water tank where everybody just wants to throw problems at you. And, and when you put a woman behind this cage it's people come out of the woodwork wanting to say nasty things to them at least three times a day i'm being called to the courtesy booth by my most emotionally well-adjusted and best equipped in terms of conversation female employee to rescue her from somebody that that she can't successfully interact with when it comes customer service basis. And when it comes to management, as far as supervising people, women are just retarded. It's, it's just, it was just horrible. There's always some kind of game. There, there's, there's always plucking nerves and, and trying to get over on other people. And you can never really build a team function with the woman in charge. It's, it's okay. She's a figurehead. Like if she's the owner or something like that, if she's going to have a man implement a bunch of stuff, and she signs off on it. That's okay. But if, if she's the person trying to make the decisions, no, nah, no. Nah. And, and it doesn't just go with dealing with other women. It goes with it, it goes with dealing with other people who they want to keep under them. For instance, black women, you can't put them in charge of a black man. I, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll be calling the police trying to have this guy arrested because he just doesn't jump as high as she says when she says it. It's that bad because they're used to having the hammer in their domestic situation and, and with urban blacks in Baltimore, the woman's used to having a hammer and she doesn't want to have to abide by any company rules when she's dealing with uh, this, this black dude is working for her where if she was dealing with him in a house, she would just call the police and have them kick his ass or she would call up her brothers and have them kick his ass. And she's totally dysfunctional in a management setting. So there's a, there's a real lack there. I think it's a, the biggest mistake is putting women into management and into politics. That's, uh, that's far worse than having them work. And in a lot of ways, they're better. They tend to be better workers than men and tend to be happier working than a lot of men, as long as they're treated right. Like, for instance, if they have an appreciative father figure, supervising them rather than some draconian evil stepmother type of person that's going to continue to put them down just because they're younger and better looking than she is. And you know what? If she's in charge, everybody on the crew is younger and better looking than she is. (laughs) You know, so she hates everybody and it's just horrible. It's a mess. Now there's another thing that pioneer women used to do. I'm looking at a narrative of the captivity sufferings and removes of Mrs. Mary Rawlinson. And there's a picture of her with her musket 
trying to fight off a band of four Abenaki Indians. Women in a smaller scale society actually have to be, yeah, they have to be able to fill in for the man when he's not there. So they need to understand what he is and they need to admire what he is instead of just trying to rip him apart all the time in order for them to step up in that position. Well, we didn't even talk about washing machines. I thought that's what a woman was for. I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> you, if I had to wash by hand, I wouldn't be able to do anything else. You wouldn't get dinner. There would be no other chores done. Just simply wash all day long. That's another aspect. If you're in a, if you're in a hunting and gathering society, the woman's already got that repetitive motion wear and tear with washing. A lot of it necessarily done on their knees. So when you take that and then you put her in a town and she's grinding grain all day, then, again, the knees go that much quicker. The women who had servants, and this is a reason to have servants, the women that had servants, it's not that they didn't do any work. Ancient women, unless they were royalty, did work. In fact, Odysseus, who was the king of Ithaca, the subject of the Odyssey, his wife, I forget her name, but the whole house was... Penelope, the whole house full of suitors was there for her. For her loom. She, she, yeah, she spent yeah. most of her time weaving on her loom. Yeah. Well, that's something that it's not going to beat you up nearly as much as washing clothes, which the poor girl that uh, Odysseus shipped home in chains from Troy was probably scrubbing the cro- clothes in the crick out back. And the and loom the- also is uh, good work for women because you can pick it up and drop it every. 30 seconds. That's <laughs> what I about with the intervals. I, if you can see, that's how my work intervals are about no more than five minutes long. So that's why it takes me weeks and weeks to edit these podcasts and put them up, okay? <laughs> Not to mention books. Yeah, your work is very much appreciated. It, to me, the biggest corruption of our society, number one, is, is just settled down in surplus based uh, civilizations that are ruled over by a military order that has a different origin, that really has a nomad order. The, the, the nomadic people are really the masculine evolution of the hunter and gatherer, and a civilized person is the, uh, the feminine evolution of it. In fact, even conquering people in the Americas, even when they didn't have a lot of herd animals, there was this one group that the Aztecs feared called the Sons of the Dog, and they were called that because dogs were the only beasts of burden they had. And they, they lived traveling around. So they were always with their dogs. And when you take this society that's that, that has this idea that to be a man, you're mobile and you fight. And then that conquers a surplus based society that pushes the man down in the household. You've got this big corruption that just ripples down through the ages. And to me, the, the crowning indignity is... I'm sure you're smarter than I am, but you shouldn't be allowed to vote, okay, just because... You shouldn't be allowed to vote either, James. (laughs) I'm not allowed to vote. I don't permit myself to vote because I wouldn't trust myself with it, okay? We're not super friendly to democracy around here, (laughs) but as long as I have the vote, I will be voting, okay? I'm not going to... Not going to abdicate well, that. Well, you might as well. Mentally, you're, you're superior than most of the men that we have out there. And the, but the problem is, and it doesn't have anything to do with the intelligence of women. What it has to do with is the fact that it's easy to scare them. And they're pre-made hostages. A, a woman who has a child is already in a hostage situation. Period. Whatever happens, if it's an earthquake, if it's a fire, if it's a new tax bill, if it's a new government, if it's an invasion, she's in a hostage situation. Yeah. Speaking as a a somewhat late in life mom, definitely not as late as a lot of my peers here. It's hard to overstate how much it changes you. This the settled household. If you look at the war between the the Maryland and Virginia against the Susquehannocks, where you got. 70,000 people waging war on 500 people. The Susquehannocks win that war because they're not a settled people. They managed to move their elderly, their children, and their families out of the way because they were nomadic people, even though they were temporarily operating out of a fort. Uh, Once you get a a society, even a warlike society like them, once you put them in a settled situation, then they're, they're 
their families being held hostage. And this is where you get the imperial society. This is where you get Rome. This is where you get the U.S. with 941 military bases around the world. Every day, some guy from the United States is killing somebody overseas. You get this because the government that controls the domestic structure is holding everybody's families hostage. And you can't move them. You're, you're scaled up to the point where nomadism, and unless you're really poor and you've got a really, really adaptable woman with you, for instance, if you're Bonnie and Clyde, you're a pair of criminals, that's about the only way you can sexually make nomadism work. Some people are doing it with RVs now. But so there's still that impulse there. That's how you get men to go over and, and kill for bad reasons, for acquiring territory or defending territory for their family. That doesn't result in a whole lot of intensive warfare. Uh, the, the worst wars happen when people are trying to make a profit off of it at the top. Yes. And they really can't do that until they until they get a male population that's got their own built in hostages as families. Yeah. That's why Alexander wanted his men to marry these women in all these other countries. He didn't want them just to be able to go sell their sword to some rival. And not just uh, in, in, in modern times, it's not enough to have a wife or children. You have to have a mortgage. You have to have a car payment. You have to. I mean, it's incredible. My former employer used to incentivize uh, homeownership, and it was an unspoken expectation for promotion that you had to, you had to get into this deal. I went, I went through that when I came to Baltimore to just get this job in a grocery store and make enough money to, to get to Mexico and then walk down to Terra del Fugo. It was my great big plan, but I ended up with a wife and child and I was treated so well by my employers and they were actually using me to undercut these department managers, guys that fought in World War II, guys that weren't willing to change. Well, I was willing to do whatever these people wanted me to do. And I did a good job at it. So they always rewarded me and they treated me nice. And that was a big part of it. They treated me respectfully. They didn't take time out of the time to, to be nice to me. They just told me I did a good job. I did a good job. Well, I decided to buy a house. And this one guy, his name is Mr. Tony Causland. He lost two fingers fighting in Korea. And I had already been used to displace the World War II vet, Larry, in, in the grocery department. And now Larry's cackling uh, behind his cigar because Mr. Tony has got me restructuring his department now. So this punk kid is now showing his old Korean War vet how to restructure his dairy department. And uh, it, it didn't go down very well. But then when he found out that I had just gotten a mortgage and it was all through the store because the loan officer came to the store to talk to the employer to see what my status was as an employee. And the girl in the office told everybody that, you know, Jimmy's got a mortgage and he comes over to me as this big tall guy. And he smiled at me and said, congratulations on the house. And I said, well, thanks. He said, you know what? He said, it's all going to change, Wonder Boy. <laughs> he said, he said you, just, you just had your last day of freedom. He said, the whip is going to be coming down. And now you're going to know how it's been for me. And I did. Yeah. It was yeah. like, I got talked to like, like I was a dog that, that wet the rug the very next day. And I hadn't even done anything wrong. It was just to let me know that I was now a slave. <laughs> I was locked in for 30 years. Yeah, they were paying me over entry level rate that I could get anywhere else. I I was only able to afford this mortgage on this house. I was I got a mortgage on a house. I was making like seven dollars an hour. Wow. 1982. I think. But that year I made seventeen one seven dollars an hour. I ended up grossing almost twenty thousand dollars. And uh, they told the loan officer, don't worry. Uh, as soon as he buys this house. He'll be making over $20,000 a year and he'll be able to afford it. And they were business people. They owned a lot of property. So yeah, he, he went ahead with it. But, you know, they knew that you know, they were going to work me like a dog. It took me another 12 years. It, or it took me another nine and a half years before I was able to gain enough experience that I could shop myself out at high ent entry level positions at other places because they intentionally – Never gave me a title. 
they always paid me with bonuses and overtime. Uh, so I couldn't show that I had uh, this rate of pay or anything. Uh, so th- our whole society is just set up like that. And I, I'm glad to be out of it. It feels successful that I'm you know, making a tiny amount of uh, money. My son informed me that doing my taxes next year is going to be very easy. <laughs> <laughs> you probably <laughs> fell off the, uh, the tables. <laughs> you know? Yes. <laughs> okay, so. So there you go. That's the history of humanity through the lens of the role of the woman. With a creepy old guy at the end of time peeking over the feminine shoulder, <laughs> uh, commenting on it. <laughs> you know, we're in this together. The, that's the bottom line. So, all right, James. That was a good one. Thank you. Episode right. 31 of the Crackpot Podcast with Lafon and Lockhart. Before we go, listeners, please, I direct you to Amazon.com. Search for James Lafond, L-A-F-O-N-D, and buy some books. There's hundreds of them. And <laughs> go to JamesLafond.com and buy some PDF books. There's very good ones there. Very affordable as well. And go to Patreon and learn about the history of slavery in North America. And go to PayPal and send him some money. He's a nice guy. All right. Take care. We'll meet again under the sun. And in 12 minutes, and another one's gone. This meets in your makeup.